I'm going to ask you to join me in your Bibles in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, I'll begin reading in verse 1 in just a moment. But before I begin to read our sermon text this morning, I want to ask you to join me in this prayer as we approach God's word together. my eyes and I shall see incline my heart and I shall desire order my steps and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments my eyes and I shall see incline my heart and I shall desire order my steps and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments Acts 15 verse 1 here now the word of the Lord. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. And from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And then join me in verse 30. And when they were sent off, that's, that's Paul and Barnabas, when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they, had, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. And Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Let's pray. 
Father, help us now to hear your voice speaking to us through your word. Help us to humble ourselves and receive this gift that you have given to us. Would you open our ears, our eyes, our hearts to receive the work of your spirit now and to be changed by him. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We have chosen to continue with our sermon series in the book of Acts this morning, which brings us to a strange, kind of an odd text for Easter Sunday morning. Easter is supposed to be about unbridled joy. It's supposed to be an, about an all-out celebration. In contrast, Acts 15 is about a meeting. And not just any meeting, it's about a church meeting. Now, I grew up in a pastor's home. I've been in vocational ministry for most of my adult life. And as a result, I've been to a lot of church meetings. And none of them, not one of them, has filled me with unbridled joy. Not one of them has caused me to celebrate with a celebration that's appropriate for Easter Sunday. Those meetings have brought more of the heavy eyelids of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane or, or maybe even the bloody sweat drops of Jesus. So what are we doing? Why, on Easter Sunday... Are we talking about something so torturously boring as a church meeting? And even more than that, given our current circumstances, why are we talking about celebration at all? Maybe Easter should be canceled like everything else. Well, instead of that, I want us to come to Acts 15. I want us to come to this church meeting and find that this meeting leads us to joy. It leads us to celebration by uncovering the enemy of our joy and by discovering the possibility of our joy. So first of all, the enemy. Acts chapter 14 ends on a high note. Paul and Barnabas return from their travels to their sending church in Antioch. And they celebrate. They revel in all of the amazing things that God has done. Especially they celebrate how God has brought the Gentiles into the saving embrace of Jesus. And into his community, the church. But the beginning of chapter 15 interrupts the party of chapter 14. The police show up and they say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Turn down the music, stop the dancing. You can't celebrate the inclusion of the Gentiles because the Gentiles haven't done enough to be included. They need to be circumcised. They need to take on the Jewish law. They need to take on all of the customs and culture of the Jewish people. And then, and only then, maybe, maybe we can talk about a party. And this interruption disintegrates the shared joy of the community in Antioch into division and confusion. And so Paul and Barnabas go to the church in Jerusalem for help. And the party poopers follow them. And we arrive at this tense conversation in Acts 15. And into this conversation steps Peter. And he frames the situation. He describes what's happening with a very significant image. He says to the opponents of Barnabas and Paul, he says to them, you are putting a yoke on the Gentiles. That is too heavy. Now the image of a yoke is common in the Old Testament as an image of God's law. 
in the way that a yoke would bring an animal and guide an animal into a task, the law of God was supposed to bring people to God, involve them and guide them in his mission, his ways, what he wants to do in the world. The problem is that didn't work. Because of the power of sin, that yoke, the yoke of the law, became too heavy. It became too heavy for anyone. This is what Peter is saying, whether Jew or Gentile, no one can ever do enough. The yoke can't bring people to God and guide them in his way. It cannot pull them towards him, in the end, because of the power of sin, it only pushes people away from him. It pushes people into isolation, into alienation. It does not draw them into the joy of a life with God, but it drives them into the misery of a life at a distance from God, and from others. The website Artnet recently listed 15 images from art history that capture the experience of social distancing. And I noticed one especially because it is an image that hangs at the Columbus Museum of Art. It's Edward Hopper's painting, Morning Light. And this painting shows a woman sitting on a bed and gazing out a window as the morning sun shines through. And with that description, maybe you think it's a painting about happiness. It's a painting about tranquility or peace. But it isn't. The light that shines through the window is pale and cold. The face of the woman is disturbingly blank. Her posture is closed off. As with much of Hopper's work, this is an image of modern isolation, alienation. And the reason that images like that endure, the reason images like that connect to us is because they resonate with our experience. Life can feel like that sometimes, can't it? Even when we're not quarantined. We know the experience of isolation and alienation. And the insight of Acts chapter 15 is that it shows us the cause of that isolation. What causes that painful loneliness isn't modern urban society. It isn't stay at home or shelter in place orders from our government officials. No, what causes that painful loneliness is a yoke. It is the yoke of not enough. It is the voice, whether that's the Old Testament law or some other standard, it is the voice that says to us, you haven't done enough. You don't have enough. You aren't enough. And we take that unbearable weight on ourselves and we put that unbearable weight on others and on our situation. And it does not bring us to the joy of a life with God. No, it pushes us away from him, away from others, and it leaves us isolated and afraid and angry, and perpetually dissatisfied. So how are you wearing that weight of not enough this morning? How are you putting that weight of not enough 
on others or on your circumstances. It is as you reflect on those questions that you will begin to uncover a thief. You will uncover the thief that steals away meaningful and lasting happiness. But what then? If we've uncovered the enemy, if we've found the thief, what do we do next? Well, we need to come back to this church meeting in Acts 15, and we need to see not only the enemy, but the possibility of joy. In verse 31, the community at Antioch recovers their rejoicing. And we need to ask, how? What happens at the meeting in Jerusalem that restarts the party in Antioch? And what happens to restart that party is that the debate becomes storytelling. In the midst of the tense conversation, Peter tells the story of how God had sent him with the message about Jesus to a Gentile named Cornelius. And God sent him to go and to stay at his house, which broke every social distancing law in the book of Leviticus. And then Paul and Barnabas began to tell the stories of all the amazing things that God had done, the signs and wonders that accompanied them as they brought the message of Jesus to the Gentiles. And then James says, oh, oh, wait a second. I've heard this story before. I know this one. And he reaches back to the prophet Amos, who along with other Old Testament prophets, talks about a time when God will take the broken down tent of David, which represents not only David's dynasty, but the temple, the place of God's presence that David had planned and Solomon had built. These prophets say that there will be a time when God will take those ruins he will begin a grand renovation project. And he will expand the dimensions of the place of his presence and his power to include people from all nations. And James is saying that is the story that God is telling right now as he pours out his spirit on the Gentiles. So do you notice what this storytelling does? It takes the focus off the actions of the Gentiles, which would never be enough. And it puts the focus on the actions of God, which are always enough. This is why Peter says to the opponents, Not only are you putting a too heavy yoke on the Gentiles, but you are also putting God to test. That is language from the wilderness wanderings of God's people as they tested him by forgetting what he had done and by refusing to trust that he was with them and that his presence and his power was enough for them in that place of lack and need. Peter is saying that to say that anyone needs to do anything more is to say that God has not done enough. And so can you see how this becomes an Easter text? As Peter And Paul and Barnabas and James tell their stories. They are telling the story of the empty tomb because they are narrating the results of the resurrection. You see, when Jesus walked out of the tomb, he wasn't only overcoming death, he was overcoming distance. 
He was overcoming the distance between us and God, between us and each other. See, the power of the resurrection is the power of reconciliation. And that is the power that these church leaders saw at work as the gospel came to the Gentiles, as the spirit descended on the Gentiles and God brought them to himself and to his people. They saw the power of the resurrection, working reconciliation between humanity and God and between Jew and Gentile. See, as Jesus died, the curtain in the tent of David ripped from top to bottom. And as he rose, he began that grand renovation project promised by Amos and the other prophets. He began to expand the boundaries of God's presence, the place of God's presence to include people from all nations, to include you and me. All of those who trust in him. This reminds me of another painting. It's a much older painting and a much more hopeful painting uh, than Hopper's Morning Light. It's an icon in the Eastern Orthodox tradition that goes back to probably the 5th or the 6th century. And at the top of the image, it has the Greek word anastasis which means resurrection. And it shows Jesus blazing with light and reaching out his hands over a threatening ravine. And he grasped the hands of a man and a woman who represent Adam and Eve. Because that's the power of the resurrection. That's the result of the empty tomb. God reaches towards sinful humanity. Jesus reaches into our loneliness. And he pulls us out of the pit of isolation. And he draws us into a reunion with God and with others. And that reunion is the recovery of joy. That reunion is what restarts the party in Antioch. Will it restart the party in your life? See, we are faced with the same question as that of the early church. Where will our focus be? Where will our attention be? Will we be focused on the actions of ourselves or others? Or will we be focused on the actions of God in Christ Jesus? Will you continue to strive under the exhausting weight of that yoke, the yoke of never enough? Or will you hear the voice of the one who conquered sin, Satan, and death saying to you, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Because my yoke is easy. My burden is light. A couple of summers ago, my family uh, went to the Hawking Hills and we did the Cedar Falls Trail. And many of you have done that hike, but when we arrived at the falls, I was disappointed. I was disappointed because it was a hot summer day. And, and the water of that waterfall and the pool looked so inviting and so refreshing. And so I didn't want to just look at the water. I wanted to get in the water. The problem is that there are signs up all around that say, don't do that. No wading, no swimming. Don't get in the water. 
But fortunately, on that day, there was a rebellious young woman there who ignored the signs, who broke the rules, and she went into the water anyway, and we all followed her, and we had a great time. Jesus is a little like that rebellious young woman. Only he hasn't ignored the signs. He's torn them down. He has torn down the no swimming signs and he leads us into the life giving water of God's presence and power. And that is where joy is found. That's why this church meeting in Acts 15 teaches us to celebrate. See, this meeting puts up new signs. Signs that say, come on in. Leave behind the unbearable weight of never enough and wade in to the water of God's excessive enoughness. In Jesus. So will you hear that invitation? Will you read those signs and shout hallelujah? Let's pray. Father, we do ask this morning that you would lead us to joy. There are so many reasons to grieve, and we are grateful that you welcome our grief, you welcome our tears, you welcome our sadness, but that's not all that you do. You have come through your son, Jesus, and you have invaded our dark isolation. You have invaded our lives with the power of reconciliation. And through Jesus, you do what the law could not do. You draw us to yourself and make us a part of what you are doing in this world. Father, would you help us to wade into the water? Would you help us to leave behind those unbearable burdens and take up the yoke of Jesus and be filled with the joy of his resurrection. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.